So thanks, everybody. It is really great to be back here actually standing in front of three-dimensional people. When we were last together, I showed you a slide that looked just like this. And I made the claim that we were all moving into this world we called kind of a multi-service, multi-cloud world. And it's absolutely true. If anything, COVID, um, the rush to digital transformation, the growing interest and demand for AI ML is just driving this even faster than we, we anticipated. And in many cases, it's all around how do you get data from the left side of this chart to the cloud and then get it back. And right in the middle there, all those connections, that's the service provider world, right? They're the ones that sit between the end customer and the cloud, and pretty much everything that gets to the cloud comes to a service provider. And therein lies a lot of opportunity, right? Because the service providers have the customer proximity. And the question is, okay, how do you actually build this thing, right? And when you have something that is so complicated as the edge of the network and the metros of the network, which are vastly complicated network infrastructure, sometimes it helps just to step way back from it and look at it with a really simple construct like we've done here, right? You say, okay, I've got residential, I've got enterprise, I've got wireless, I've got to get to the cloud. Well, how far apart can that be? And then how big are those connections? And we've done work over the last couple of years, there's actually some pretty good um, results saying, look, how far apart what we would call mean time to cloud, we use that term instead of latency, because when I say latency to somebody, they all think they, they have a definition of it. But that's from whatever device that lives at the edge of the network, your smartphone, your computer, your crypto miner, whatever it is, out and back to the cloud, how far can that be? And there's real physics involved in that one. And then there's how big are those connections? And the short answer is 5, 10, 15 milliseconds, which translates into, in most networks, at most a couple hundred kilometers to get to the cloud. And then how big, well, that's what's driving all the development in PON, XGS PON, NG PON 2, 25 gig PON, 50 gig PON, 100 gig PON. But what's been really interesting to see is once fiber is out at the edge of the network, there really is no limit to what you can do in terms of connectivity. If you want a terabit to the edge of the network, we can do that for you. You know, we can now put 400 gig in the palm of your hand, right? We're going to put 800 gig in the palm of your hand in the next iteration. A terabit, 1.6 terabits comes after that. And so it's worth asking, okay, how do you actually build that kind of an infrastructure? So what I've done here is kind of just double clicked one level deeper. And a couple things to note. Well, first off, the cloud really has a couple different components to it. There is certainly the core. But there's this emergence of this concept of the edge cloud. A lot of that is there to meet that mean time to cloud requirement. And the type of services that an enterprise wants now span a very broad range of capacities and connection styles. Sure, they still want what we'd call classic IP services. But those we know ultimately turn out to be best effort. We've got to do a lot to fix that and make it a a really guaranteed service. And so they started to migrate towards very high speed circuits and dark fiber. At a wireless location, 25 gig, 50 gig, 100 gig is becoming more common. We even know some carriers that are sitting there looking at it and say, I'm going to pick the rates the cloud guys use because we know the volumes are going to be so high, prices are going to be low. It's going to be an economic choice. And we've got what's going on in the residential side, all the broadband build-outs with PON and such. And so it's really a good question of how do you actually build this thing where you've got to be able to provide all sorts of different IP services, but on this now fiber-based infrastructure. And from the service provider point of view, there's kind of a competitive angle to this also because they know the hypergiants, the big cloud guys, they're building out in parallel because they're all very well motivated to get traffic, their traffic, off of the public internet and onto their infrastructure as soon as they can as it flows towards the cloud because that's the only way they can really give you a guaranteed experience. If they leave it on public internet, they really can't give you the kind of experience that they want to. And so this drives towards a very interesting problem statement because the cloud, the velocity that the cloud can deliver service is just different than the velocity at which a service provider can. And you can guess on my two little pet critters up here which one is which, but closing that gap between the speed of the cloud and the speed of the network is part of what we're trying to accomplish here. And there's probably no better example of what happened to most of us during COVID 
You go home, you got to work, you could download, pick your tool. WebEx, Teams, Zoom, BlueJeans, whatever you had, get it up and instantiated in a minute or two. If you had to make a change to your internet service, move, add, change, create, whatever, days, hours, weeks, months, if you could do it at all. And it's closing that gap that is so important to really delivering on the kind of metro infrastructure that we all need and want. And so every once in a while, nature cooperates. Right? If you're into astronomy, you'll remember this event where two neutron stars came together and created something that up until that time had never been seen in the universe before, a supermassive star. Well, every once in a while you can say, can we take that kind of principle and apply it into our space? Are there some things that we can now do that we could never do before? And the answer is yes, we can. Right? We know that the OSI stack got us to where we are today richly connected. We can do things that were just unimaginable 10 years ago. But it was built on a principle largely of opaqueness. I mean, this stuff dates back to when there were protocol wars, and we weren't sure whether we were going to be on copper or fiber or ethernet or token ring. All sorts of different choices were out there. So today, you ask the question, well, if I can start to break that down and actually see through all those layers, and build the network differently, can I get a better result? And the answer is yes. And I've labeled this specifically right down at the bottom photonic spectrum, because that's an alien term in the world of protocols and digital. Because what happens is you come down the stack, you get more and more analog. At the top, it's all digital and it's protocols, and we're all very comfortable with that. Not everybody is so comfortable when you come down, the down and talk about wavelengths and photonic spectrum and things like DBM and signal to noise ratio and terahertz. That's kind of alien to the, the protocol world. And so you start and you say, well, what if I just kind of plug these things together? I've got some building blocks. I can take a router, I can plug, put a plug into it. I can create a very high capacity wavelength. I can do coherent detection on it. The problem with just doing that is you've taken this lovingly crafted all digital environment and you've put analog ports on it and you want to treat it as a digital device and it just inherently isn't. Because what that analog port is speaking to is what's all along the bottom. Multiplexing, demultiplexing, reconfigurable optical edge off, multiplexers, amplifiers, all this stuff. And what governs that world is things like signal level, signal to noise, bandwidth, crosstalk, nonlinearity. It's a whole bunch of other stuff. So how do you map these two worlds, this analog world and the digital world together and make a better metro infrastructure? How do you really converge these two largely disparate technologies when we know we can? We can see through all those layers. So let's take advantage of that. And visibility, I'm going to claim, is absolutely the key to this. Can you see what is happening both at the digital environment, the protocol environment, and the photonic environment? Can I see from the packet flows that I'm so interested in all the way down to what's fundamentally carrying those packets, that information, the photons. So visibility is job one. The second piece is once I can see it and I can measure it, can I start to correlate events? Can I see through things and understand why all of a sudden my hop, cap, my hop count went up? What happened down somewhere else in my infrastructure to make that happen? Why is latency all of a sudden changing on me when I know I traffic engineered this thing, but now something's changed? Why would that have happened? Well, because a lot goes on in all those different layers. And so throughout all the layers in the network now, we need to have visibility. Because the fundamental principle that we're operating on here is if you're going to automate this, right? go back to my you know, speed, of vo the velocity of the cloud versus the velocity of the network. You can't automate what you can't see. It's just impossible. You have to be able to see it to really do a good job of automation. And that means through all the layers, photonic services, Ethernet, flows, all the way up to what we typically know and love, right? Layer 3 IP MPLS, segment routing, all the things that we want to bring into the marketplace. But you have to see all of that to do a good job. And in fact, once you do it, you can get some really interesting changes in how the network operates. And this is a pretty good example. An elephant flow lands on the network. Now, typically, they would have traffic engineered this thing, but you have to know about it. Right? This is when the machine turns on in CERN. This is when all of a sudden somebody's got a big data set up 
information that they've got to get to the cloud for AI ML. All of a sudden, video goes viral and everybody wants to see the same thing all at once. Right? How does the network respond to that? Once you've got visibility, once you've got automation, once you've automated what you can see and you can see everything, then all of a sudden the network can become a sensor of its own requirements. And it adapts without all this manual intervention. That's the end goal. That's closing that gap between the velocity of the cloud and the velocity of the infrastructure. So we created a framework. Now, interestingly enough, we looked at it and said, OK, is there some way to, to weight what you do on control plane versus management plane versus data plane? Because usually these companies are expert in one or maybe two, but rarely three. We set about and said, no, we actually have to be good at all three of these things. We've done you know, various versions of control plane at the optical layer. Well, we've got to extend that up the stack. We've got hugely capable data planes, terabit class. We've got to understand how that interacts with that photonic layer. Then we've got to be able to manage this whole thing, see through all the layers, present it to people so they can understand what's going on in their network. And you've got to absolutely take a running start at this thing. Now, I will tell you, the fellow that we modeled there, that's a fellow that James Glover works for us. And he um, first ran away from this when we asked him to go after this, because it's a hard problem. But you're going to hear later in the conference from him how we went about solving all this. Because it's a really interesting story about what you have to do to really get the operational convergence that you want. And so this is what we've come up with. Right? We call it a true convergence for the multi-cloud world. Now, we've been doing terabit edge for, for a while. And I'll go back to a fiber in the ground kind of inherently comes to you with 40, 50, 60 terabits worth of capacity if that's what you want. I mean, that's what we can light fibers to do today, even if it's sitting there at your house. If that's what you wanted, it's possible to do it from the physics. We know how to build the bottom layer. That's what we've been good at for years and years, right? That's your photonic infrastructure. But I want to remind you, I put on specifically on there, terahertz of bandwidth. That's an analog parameter. And what that thing cares about are things like signal-to-noise ratio and power levels and all sorts of stuff that higher up in the stack, it's just immaterial, right? It's stuff that you care about down at the lower layers, the analog world, but you need to see it to understand what goes on the entire infrastructure. To that, we've built a large-scale router. Now, it looks different, right? The front panel on that thing's a trapezoid for a very good reason, because of the way it can handle connectivity. And it's purpose-built for the service provider infrastructure. Right, it's optimized for the environment I described earlier on, that multi-service, multi-cloud infrastructure that we all want. And it supports the terabit flows, and it supports the gigabit flows. That's the scalability. And then the key to this, the off-box software, which you'll hear about more later as well, manage control and plan. Right, that's the suite of software tools that lets you actually run this thing and operate it in a way that you can do what you need to in terms of building a network. So why do it this way? Well, there's three really good reasons. One is simplicity. The edge of the network is some of the most complex infrastructure anywhere, just in terms of the richness of the number of locations, multi-tenant, single house, large enterprise, huge factory. So from a service provider point of view, I've got to have something that is simple to operate, even it's, so it's hugely complex. And the way you hide that, you hide complexity with software tools and automation. It's scalable. Photonics are inherently scalable, gigabits to terabits. Straightforward thing to do. 400 gig in the palm of your hand, put it anywhere you want. 400 gig anywhere in the world. But probably most important over the long term is it's sustainable. Sustainable from a power, from a cooling, from a technology point of view. This was built for the central office environment. In terms of thermal management, space, depth, all the rest of it. It was built service provider specific. And it's built to su survive through multiple generations of technology. Because we know what we've been able to do on the photonic layer. Right? 400 gigi is about the fastest rate you can get in a normal switched routed infrastructure. We've been doing 800 gig IP circuits for three years. Next year, we're going to be doing 1.6 terabit circuits. And we still can't land even 800 on a good switch router yet. But now we can. Right? So we've put this together in a way that it's sustainable, scalable, and simple.